Welcome to our final focus lecture in the series for this year. It is an honor tonight to have Buford Smith and Sean Walker here with us. Before I dive in exactly to um, our conversation and introduce them more specifically, I just wanted to give a little bit of the background about how it is I came to know your work, which is, as Alex mentioned, through Lewis Draper, who grew up here in Richmond, Virginia. And his sister, who's in the audience tonight, Nell Draper Winston, brought his photograph to me here five years ago, and I was absolutely blown away by his work and wanted to know why I hadn't known his work before, and then realized very quickly that he was a founding member of Kamoinge. I'm going to read from Kamoinge's own history, just two sentences describing Kamoinge. Kamoinge was founded in 1963 as a collective of African-American photographers seeking artistic equality and empowerment. It works as a forum in which members view, nurture, critique, and challenge each other's work in an honest and understanding atmosphere. Based in New York City, it has met continuously since 1963, so it is still a thriving group. And so I quickly learned how integral Louis Draper had been to Kamoinge, but that opened the door to the members of Kamoinge, and I, the revelations about this work went on and on as I got to know each of the photographers um, and just understood what a compelling story this was, which many, many people know, but which has not been in a lot of the history of photography books, and so I felt that this story needs to be heard more, needs to be understood as an integral story to the history of photography in the 1960s. I think that if we don't know about the Black Photographer's Annual and Kamoinge in the 60s and the 70s, we don't understand what photography in America was in the 1960s and 70s. So that is just a little bit of a background of how I came to know um, Buford and Sean and why I wanted to bring them down. So the, the other context is, out of that research grew an exhibition on the Black Photographer's Annual, which was an annual founded by Buford Smith, who was a co-founder and, um, and chief photography editor, and he was working with Sean Walker as a picture editor, as well as some of the other members of Kamoinge. Um, and we're going to spend the whole evening talking about it, so I'm not going to I'm not going to get too into it. But that, in addition to Kamoinge, the annual grew out of their work and was an effort to um, produce a publication by Black photographers for Black photographers at a moment when Black photographers weren't getting recognition and representation in the mainstream media. And so we're going to talk about that project too. So. There's something of a four-part structure for tonight. Um, Buford and Sean are each going to give you a brief overview of their larger body of work. I've asked them to do something impossible. I've asked them within 10 to 12 <laughs> slides, <laughs> which I understand is extraordinarily painful, to give you just a sense from their perspective of some of the things that have been important to them in their career, before we then have a conversation about how the Black Photographer's Annual came to be, and then also about the early years, so really just about Kamoinge. And then we're going to close before we head up to hear some jazz by talking a little bit about what jazz meant to Kamoinge. So there's your overview for the structure of the evening. Um, Buford Smith was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and is a self-taught photographer. He was the founder and chief photography editor of the Black Photographer's Annual from 1973 to 1981. He's also the founder of Cesare Photo Agency. He joined the Kamoinge Workshop in 1965, a couple years after it was founded, and he served as the collective's president from 1997 through 2003. He's taught photography at Cooper Union, Hunter College, and the Brooklyn Museum of Art. He received a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in 1990 and 2000, as well as a Lightwork Artist in Residence Fellowship and an Aaron Siskin Fellowship. He's had solo exhibitions most recently at Keith Lellis Gallery, that show just closed, as well as the Studio Museum in Harlem, New York University, the Schomburg Center, I'm really Corcoran Gallery, Tate Modern is upcoming, I'm kind of 
just skimming uh, just a few. And his works are, again, these are just a few collections in the work of the museum, in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, Princeton University, Schomburg collection, um, of course, the VMFA, um, as well as the Library of Congress. And a few notes on Sean. Sean was born and raised in Harlem, has a BFA from Empire State College, and was a founding member of the Kamoinga Workshop. He's exhibited throughout the world, including the Smithsonian, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the Brooklyn Museum, PS1, um, and as well as the Whitney Museum, the International Center for Photography, and the Museum of Modern Art. Um, his, um, he's received a, he's, a, he's taught photography for almost 40 years, including at the International Center of Photography, City College, Borough of Manhattan Community College, uh, Queensburg Community College, and San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, as well as Columbia University. He's a Soros Fellowship uh, recipient, and he's also had grants from the New York Foundation for the Arts, Lightwork, and Columbia University Film Board. So with that, I'm gonna let them proceed with their impossible task <laughs> of giving us a little bit of an interview. I'm gonna grab the clicker. A little bit of an overview. Oops, step there. So, Buford. This photograph is in the museum's collection. And is, oh, should I hold it? If you want, unless oh. you can tell me to click. No. <laughs> I can, I'm happy to control the clicker. Oh, that's the, the power. Oh, that's okay. the clicker. But I'm, I can whatever well, you want. I can do it. <laughs> Now this photo, well I can't actually see the dates too well. 1965, that's a uh, woman in doorway, thank Harlem. Thank you, this was taken in Harlem. I lived on the Lower East Side during this time, but I would travel to Harlem and photograph in Harlem as well as the Lower East Side. And this photograph was taken in front of Mr. Michelle's bookstore. And I would see this woman sitting in the doorway. I saw her there twice. And I said, well, let me uh, take a photograph of her with, oh, with the uh, advertisement of the uh, posters and the books that were, she was surrounded by. And I took the photograph, and just as I took the photograph, she looked at me, and I just knew she was gonna be angry, but she smiled, and I just nodded and said, you know, like, thank you. And I end, end up getting, giving her a photograph eventually. Now, this photograph was taken when I lived on the Lower East Side, it was also called uh, the East Village. This was uh, a woman who I f felt was very, uh, she was very uh, a very bubbly type woman, very outgoing. During the 60s, uh, I guess good vi the phrase good vibration was popular then. So <laughs> she came, to, uh, a friend introduced me to her because her husband was in the uh, Navy, I think, and he needed some photographs of her. <laughs> well, I, I shouldn't have said it like that, but uh, uh, so she uh, was introduced to her, and I took some regular snapshots of her in my uh, apartment. I had a backdrop, et cetera. And so I said, you know, uh, I won't call her name, but she's a, a psychotherapist in, in New York City now. And I said, well, you know, I would like to photograph you, hang out with you for one day or whatever, and just photograph, because she was very vivacious and, oh, very bubbly person. So she said, okay, fine. Uh, she said, what about tomorrow? I said, okay, great. So I went to her house, the photographer, and it started to rain. I said, oh, boy. I said, well, you know, we have to cancel this uh, uh, shooting assignment. And she started undressing. So I'm looking. <laughs> So she said, well, I'm going to go up on the roof and take a shower. So I said, take a shower? She said, yes, it's rainy. I'm going to go up on the roof and take a shower. And she said, do you want to come? <laughs> so I said, you know, I got, you know, I like women, but I didn't want to get in dress, get up on the roof, take a shower. <laughs> so I said, well, I tell you what, do you mind if I photograph you while you're up on the roof taking a shower? She said, no. So that's the story of that photograph. Thank you. And the, uh, back, another story to that was that the Museum of Modern Art was going to purchase the photograph, but something came up. 
and uh, it, it wasn't sold. And she said, well, you know, that's the only way a black woman to get into the museum of Mount North be nude. So, <laughs> so that they didn't purchase it. And she had the baby maybe like, maybe a month later after I photographed her, and she called me, wanted me to photograph the, you know, the, the child. It was a girl, but I was on assignment in uh, Detroit, so I missed the birth of the child. And this photograph is a photograph of my wife, uh, Evelyn. Now, I have photographed her, I would, I'm willing to go on record saying, I think I photographed my wife more than uh, Alfred Stieglitz and other <laughs> photographers I photographed George O'Keefe. I could be wrong. And I will also throw in Harry Callahan. So she was, Evelyn was sitting on the couch in our house in Brooklyn. And I saw where this light was. I was amazed at the lighting. I said, Evelyn, don't move. Freeze. She said, I said, no, don't move your arm, don't move anything. So I took uh, maybe two shots of this. And this is a photograph that's been widely published and, and advertised. In fact, uh, it's in the book that Kamongi uh, published called Timeless. And they published that photograph in the Wall Street Journal from an uh, ad from the book Timeless. And this was a photograph that I took up at when I was uh, in resident at Light Work. And Light Work is a place where for artists to go spend a month and you get paid a stipend of $1,000. And I heard about uh, going to Light Work, but I couldn't afford to go for $1,000. Not that I was making a thousand dollars a month, <laughs> but I didn't want to be out the loop in the in the in, in the course of art directors or whatever calling the house calling me, and I wasn't available. If, if they called and didn't get me, they would call Sean Walker. So <laughs> I ended up. I got a cell phone. First time I owned a cell phone was in 1999, and I told my wife if anybody calls, just call me on the cell phone and I'll talk to him and whatever. So I only got about two calls, but uh, it never panned out for a job. But I end up talking to my son, Cesaire, practically every day. When I was at home, you know, he was around. We never talked. But once I went out of town, he called me practically every day. The story with this is the last day I was at light work, getting back to the reason I went to light work, is uh, Jeffrey uh, Hoon, he uh, wrote me a letter saying, Buford, you know, a lot of artists come up here and your name always pop up and would you come up? So I, like I said, I couldn't afford to go for $1,000. But then a couple of weeks later, he called me. I said, you know what, Jeffrey is calling me. He's the director of Lightwork, I better go. So I went up to Lightwork and it ended up being a fantastic experience for me. I think I did some of my best work up in Syracuse. Now this man, I would go down to this area, Celine and, and, and the Lafayette, was it Fayette? Yep. yep. Right. So to photograph in that, that section. Every time this man saw me, he would move away. He would just say, no, you're not going to take my picture. I could not photograph him. The last day I was at the light work, I had about maybe like an hour left downtime. I said, let me go down to Celine. Maybe I'll see something. I'll take a picture. Instead of sitting here in my room, went down, I saw this man, I said, oh, there he is. He saw me, he didn't move, I was stunned. He said, okay, I guess I trust you, you can take my picture now. So I, I was about maybe, what, two or three yards away from him, took one shot, and that was it, and I kind of smiled, and he didn't even make eye contact, he walked off. So that was my, one of my uh, favorite photographs of this man that I consider that a, a gift. And this was, uh, this is a picture of my partner years ago, Amanda. Now I've taken, I don't know how many pictures of her also. I would rank that also with uh, Callahan and Stieglitz uh, or whatever. Because what happens with, I think, a lot of photographers, we don't photograph the uh, per people that are close to us, especially our wives or lovers uh, or, 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 or whoever. But we were up in Nyack. This is uh, what seventy. Yeah, that's the wrong date on the on the slide. Seventy six, I think. Seventy six, <laughs> and we were going to Nyack to uh, look around to purchase a house, and we found out that you know it was a forty five minute drive from New York uh, that that it wasn't really feasible. But a lot of artists lived in Nyack during that time. 
But a man was sitting in the car when I was just getting ready to get in to, to go back to New York, and I told her, here we go again, don't move. And she didn't move, because she was accustomed to me saying, don't move, but, yeah, I want to do this. Uh, you know, sometimes I always being annoyed, not necessarily, but she froze. And that's how I got that photograph, and that's one of my favorite photographs of Amanda. As a matter of fact, her niece and her husband may be in the audience, I hope they are, Mercedes Moore and Kahani Moore, Kafani, well. And this is, I've been uh, doing a series on uh, Coney Island for the past 30 or 40 years. And uh, I, I see these guys at Coney Island maybe two or three times a year. There's a section where Puerto Ricans hang out and different, the Russians go to a certain section and the blacks, they do their thing there on uh, certain, certain, uh, certain days or weeks or whatever. So I saw these guys and the guy in the middle holding, well, the second to the left holding that object there. He, he when he sees me, he kind of speaks. I say, hey, how you doing? And that's it. So I walked by and the guy on the right of him said, take our picture. So I was surprised that, you know, after all this time, you say, take. so I said, okay. So that's how I got the picture, because I don't usually take those type of portraits, but I have done it, but uh, I couldn't believe it when I say, man, this is, you know, a, a great, well, at least I think it's an excellent photograph. <laughs> and I uh, don't usually use color, but uh, I, I see in color, of course, but in photography, I see photography as black and white, because color seems to, distract you from the content. It gets more into color and you don't see what's going on. Well, you know, that's just my opinion. And this was taken out of Coney Island again. This is a photograph of uh, a Biggie, Biggie Smalls, a portrait of him on the back of a, a man's jacket. And I was a little leery because of uh, taking the photograph, say, if this guy turns around, you know, you associate <laughs> hip hop or uh, rap, uh, you know, with a whole lot of violence or whatever. But I, you know, I like rap music, but not the gangster rap. But I say, let me take a chance and photograph this because I won't see that type of image again, especially the way Biggie was looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and the little girl, she was looking, I say, boy, and the mother was on the, uh, the right side of her, I say, I gotta take this quick, because this won't happen again, because they were waiting for the light, they were getting ready to cross the street. So, hey, Biggie, that was another gift from Biggie, thank you. <laughs> and this is from a series that I've been doing since, uh, I think, before 1990, well, uh, when I started doing it seriously, it was 19, uh, maybe 90 or something, somewhere along that area. The, the wall poster uh, type photography, I was influenced by Alpha Nora, a member of Komongi, and one of the founders of Komongi. He showed me a photograph that he did of a collage of uh, a woman. And in fact, I said, Al, can I have this? He said, oh yeah, so I've had that in my, I have over 300 some photographs that I have collected from friends, students over the years. And so I was influenced by Alpha Nora and also Aaron Siskin and doing abstract, not necessarily call it abstract, but wall poster photography. And I applied for an Aaron Siskin grant, I think it was 1999, to do, uh, co continue what Aaron Siskin had been doing with uh, poster photography, et cetera, but only uh, add uh, uh, what I would consider uh, a black aesthetic to it. And so I was photographing hip hop posters, et cetera, torn posters and so forth and so on. And in fact, one poster that I photographed, I hate for people to talk about images that the audience can't see, but I'm gonna do it this time. There's a photograph that I took of a couple, it was a liquor salesman, a liquor ad for whatever uh, liquor it was. And I showed it at one of the Kamongi meetings and uh, Tony Barbosa saw it, he jumped out of the seat. Tony is a very excitable kind of person, he jumps over, Buford, I took that picture. <laughs> So I'm saying, hey, Tony, I took that picture about a week ago. How did you take it? He said, well, what I meant was I took that picture about 10 or 15 years ago. It was an ad for some liquor company, but it had weathered, withered over the years. And so that was my connection with Tony Barbosa with his photograph. But getting, getting to the Aaron Siskin, 
I, my uh, proposal was that I wanted to add the, uh, you know, we'd seen posters by uh, Aaron Siskin, and Margaret Burt White, and a couple of French photographers, but there always been a white subject matter, and I wanted to add what I considered a black aesthetic to this genre. And I got a grant the first time I applied. I was shocked. So that was my contribution, contribution to the uh, poster art genre, black ecstatic. And this was taken this year. <laughs> so my images have shown from 65, whatever, up until a couple of months ago. This photograph was taken out in Brooklyn. I had my grandson with me, uh, uh, Nazair Smith. We were walking around, and I saw this woman there, and, and the liar. And she saw me right away with the camera. So I said, oh boy, I won't be able to photograph her. So I asked my grandson, I said, uh, Aaron, uh, I mean, uh, Nazir, he's four years old. I said, stand over by the liar. So kind of distract. <laughs> so it distracts from the woman, because she saw me, and she said, no, you're not going to do this. So my grandson, I have a picture of him. He stood over by the liar, and she just forgot all about it. So I said, OK. So I took the picture. So that was the, uh, 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 so I, I thank uh, Nazaire for that photograph. Now this photograph was taken in uh, 2015. And this uh, fellow was uh, just walking down the street on 125th Street. This was uh, Malcolm X's 90th birthday. There were protesters all up and down 125th Street. They, every year, they closed down the shops for, I think, four hours uh, on 125th Street. So I saw this guy, and I thought he was part of the demonstration to us. He wasn't marching with them, but I just had a feeling he was with them. So I asked him, you know, you mind if I take your photograph? He said, no. He said, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> What's going on? You know, this is Malcolm X's birthday, and they are protesting, uh, you know, want to close down the shop. So he said, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, so he just had on a Malcolm X uh, t-shirt, and he just happened to be walking down 125th Street. So I took his picture. Uh, I said, well, he said, you want me to put the cigarette down? I said, well, no, well, you know, I'll just crop that out, because I wanted to take the picture real quick, because cars were coming, and people hustling and bustling. So. I took the photograph, and there's uh, on his in his left hand, he has a cigarette. But I kind of cropped that out, <laughs> the cigarette out. And this is a picture in color, and I guess black and white that I I I, I enjoy. But as I said, I see in color, but I photograph in black and white. Uh, okay, here now I'm talking about color in black and white. <laughs> here's, <laughs> here's the photograph. There's a, a group that. That's, uh, that comes to a, a Brooklyn uh, a park every year. It's called the Punk Rock uh, Festival. And I went there for the first time. It was like a new world to me. I was saying, you know, what's all this? The kids had masks on, paints faded, earrings up the yin yang. I was in another <laughs> world. I said, Buford, now you see that you're, you're not 20 years old, because you're seeing this is like strange. <laughs> It was, uh, okay, I won't elaborate on that. But I saw this couple, and I said, do you mind if I photograph you? And they said no. And they even was kissing, they were doing everything. So the people there, it seemed like they were all on display that they wanted to be seen or whatever. This is the, one, this is the first time that people, it seemed like the whole group of people wanted to be photographed. So I said, well, you mind if I take your picture? And the guy said, no. And they saw a kiss, and I really didn't want that photograph, which was another. They kissed with the mask on, and it was kind of <laughs> surrealist, or maybe a man of rayish or whatever kind of thing, but I didn't really want that. So I ended up with this, and I said, you know what? I, with, about the American Gothic uh, painting, I said, OK, I'll just give this to the Afro-punk Gothic. <laughs> so that was that. So I'll quit while I think I'm ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is Beth Floyd. Oh, OK. This is a picture of, uh, of 117th Street. I was born and raised in Harlem. 
went to elementary school in Harlem, went to junior high school in Harlem, and eventually went to high school in Harlem. Uh, the elementary school is torn down, the junior high school no longer exists as a junior high school, and the high school is now something else. So when I took my son to show him where I was born, what I did, hadn't been in my block in a while, they torn down my building, they torn down the elementary school, they changed the junior high school, and they, and they changed the high school. This is um, 1960. I live, my building is the next building down to the left. I wanted to show what the blocks looked like at that period of time. I know everybody in this picture. I started out, when I got into Kamoinge, I started out, I would get my cameras loaded, get on my film, and I'm going somewhere to shoot, someplace. 125th Street was generally the place we went. I would wind up not getting off the block. I have shot so many pictures of 117th Street. I think it typified a black neighborhood during that period of time. Now, this is just before heroin. Now you gotta remember, I lived through that in Harlem, and now you guys are living through that. I really thought it had passed. So I'm, like beautiful said, I'm baffled. I'm, you know, because when I was faced with it, it was a crime. Now it's an illness, it's a disease. <laughs> you understand that once the color changes, the illness name changes. Okay, so I put this in, I put this in to show you what life was back then for us. This is my first, what, greatest hits kind of thing. A buddy had just got a new camera. We're standing on the avenue. He's showing me this camera. He said, oh yeah, take it, take a picture with it. I look up and this is the scene that presents itself. Now the two people, the woman and the man, just came out of a supermarket. But the key thing about this photograph, this guy's high. The cop was a community cop. He, he knew, this was his beat. He knew this guy. He, didn't, he stood there patiently and listened to this guy. Do you know this scene, this kid would either get cracked in the head or killed now. That's what a community, this is what community policing means. That a cop is gonna stand there, you high, babbling out of your head, and you see, and he's, and the cop just, you see how laid back he is. He's not afraid this is a black man high, I'm scared. Let me put my hand on my gun. Okay, so again, one of the earliest pictures I did in the 60s. And as I'm taking the picture, the two people just walked into the frame. So it just added a little bit more to it. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, one of my major influences was Roy G. Caraba. This is 125th Street. Most of the Kamoinge was Harlem members, so we all grew up in Harlem. And if you wanted to go someplace to shoot, you go to 125th Street, stand somewhere with your camera, you're gonna come away with some pictures. <laughs> Roy has a picture similar. It's just a young lady walking through almost like a back shot, backyard vacant thing. She's got a graduation dress. She's probably going to a graduation. So there's a shambles all around her, and here she is in this beautiful white dress. So what that did was, it gave me, it began my picture catalog in my head about the things that we know and don't think about very much, but until you see a photograph of them and you say, oh wow, I've seen that before, I never thought. So this was my answer to that. This is Easter Sunday. There's a man and a woman. Everybody thinks it's two men. This is when um, 
what was it, the genre? Um, this is when they had high heel, black men and high heels. Everybody remember them? Oh yeah, platforms. <laughs> Platform shit. This is the period when they were making those movies. And uh, I guess this was now, again, I had left the community by this time, so I didn't get a chance to shoot that series of, this was a come up town, catch you kind of photograph on Easter Sunday. But it's always been one of my favorite. And understandably, that if you've seen the brother had platforms, I think his platforms might have been higher than the shoes that the woman had on. <laughs> okay. I've shot Easter Sunday forever. Most of us shoot portfolios. Uh, started off shooting maybe in the 60s, shot it up until recently. But what I started doing was going to St. Patrick's Day. Has anybody ever went to St. Patrick's Cathedral on Easter Sunday? It's interesting, to say the least. It always reminds me of a religious Halloween day parade. <laughs> I like that. I mean, it really does. I mean, it's really kind of, you try to figure out, what does this got to do with Christ and religion and stuff? But what I had <coughs> planned to do, I've never got to it, but I've always gone up to Harlem and shoot Easter, particularly I stand around churches and photograph black women to come out of the church with these amazing hats on. I've always wanted to do an exhibition called Easter and Black and White as a metaphor for how black people celebrate Easter and how white people celebrate Easter. Never got to it, but I went out this Sunday, uh, this Easter. There are no more hats in the black churches anymore. I was... Not only was I broken hearted, I was amazed. I mean, it was never, now again, because I hadn't shot in a couple of Easter's. So I said, well, you know, I know, I, I know the churches. I live in an area where between 116th Street and 125th Street, there might be 25 churches. Not that many, but a lot. So there's like four on the corner. So I know I can just go two spots. 116th Street, 125th Street, get all the photographs I want. The crowd was younger. The only people who had hats on were the older women. I mean, the older 80s, 90s some folks, okay? My work has changed quite a bit, but I shoot events to keep me shooting my culture, trying to present black people in a very positive light. That's why Kamoinge formed. We were dissatisfied with the images that we were seeing of ourselves, even by the photographer, white photographers that we respected. That they gave their point of view of who we were, we wanted to give our point of view of who we were, and because we lived in the community, we could take our time and do it. They put on uh, the Million Youth March. So they did the Million Man March. So this was one of the Million Youth March in Harlem. And I just think it's an incredible photograph. You know, you can see the passion in the guy's face. This is a young man. And you can, his son looks more angry and revelatory than his father does. His father is enraptured. The son is like, okay. This was, and again, this might have been 10 blocks from where I live. I spent 26 years in Harlem, left, went to Cuba for a while, then lived in the Bronx, then eventually migrated down to 6th Avenue and 38th Street. So what that did was it took me out of the black pool. I had no more black subject matter. I'm in the garment district. When you walked out of your door, you had to be sure about where you were going. You could not walk out your door and stand there and think. You would get run over. <laughs> okay. So I'm trying to show you like Buford that the photographs I started off with the 60s and I'm going up to the present. In 1968, I went to Nigeria. And I'm sort of was looking for 
African religions. Started to get some information about it, but I was an outsider. So I uh, couldn't get to the places I know that they had African ceremonies, and I was really, and I went to Yoruba priest. Uh, Yoruba is the religion of Nigeria. So I'm with these guys, I said, man, well, you know, you're an outsider people. Come back, first day, day, two days I'm home. I'm beginning to be a coffee drinker. So I don't, have, I don't have coffee in the house to make. I walk up to my local coffee shop to get some coffee. I seen two women in white walking around the corner. Any photographer that's been out here in the world, you see two people in white, you follow them. <laughs> know where they're going, see what's going on. I walk into this event. Now, I ran home, got my cameras, came back here. Now again, this is two blocks from where I was born and raised. I asked the church about this. They said, oh, we've been doing this since the 40s. I have no consciousness of it. I was born and raised on 117th Street. I lived in the community for 26 years, continued to come back to the, the community in the 70s and 80s and 90s. I found out about it coming from, uh, after coming from Nigeria. This is a baptism. It is a street baptism. Uh, I've been shooting it, I started shooting in 86, but what they do to baptize the people is they take a pie hose <coughs> and just go across the street and, and everybody, whoever wants to get wet, can get baptized. <laughs> right, so this is sort of after the water, but I tried to pick what I thought was the most dramatic thing because you can see the age level, you can see the rapture, and this is a Pentecostal church. I, uh, in my youth, I went looking for God. I went to every church that there was. I went to Catholic church and, and all the churches. The young lady that I was enamored of, Lavinia, I'll never forget her name, I'm 15. She said, well, you know, if you want to hang out with me, you gotta go to my church. Now again, I'm coming out of uh, Baptist churches. I go to this church and they got almost look like a jazz band set up. They got a snare drum set up, <laughs> guitar player, and trumpet player. Kind of trying to figure out what's going on here. They started, I started clapping, and I don't know what else happened. Seriously. And I kept trying to figure out, but I know my hands were swollen. And I said, oh, wow. Didn't get the girl, but I definitely understood that if I was going to go to church, I was going to go to a Pentecostal church. Because <laughs> that's where it's happening. I think, no, very seriously, and I, I, I mean this. If I'm going to go to church, there's something about there in touch with God that seems very, very real for me. You know, it's not, and I'm not knocking anybody's religion, but you gotta remember, I'm an artist, the things that I see. When I was in Cuba, the, the chaperones kept saying, why don't you take those old houses when we got all these new houses we want you guys to shoot? Well, I see the aesthetics in the old houses. So it's the same thing with a Baptist church. If you ever come to this event, I keep saying to myself, one year I wanna get a waterproof camera so I don't have to run from the water. <laughs> This was, I guess, my turning point, and this is an important photography, photograph for me. I photographed it at night. It was way down on the Lower East Side somewhere, and we were on our way to a theater. I think I photographed that thing every time I passed it because it was that night, and the slow, shutter, uh, slow, um, slow uh, lenses and shutter speeds, and I didn't know if it was gonna get blur. But it was one of the metaphors and one of the things, again, that Kamonge dealt with, and I remember, I'm out of high school, I went to high school for photography. Didn't know anything about art. Didn't know anything, if you ask me what a metaphor was, I had no idea what a metaphor was. I learned metaphors, and this was 
for me, what was about, what was happening to us as a, as a nation, as black people, right? It's one of the few posters, but the chain and the fence really said, this is jail, we're in prison, whether we're conscious of it or not. And it's one of my favorite photographs because Buford talked about his wall photograph. And let me just say about how Kamonge influenced each other. I saw Buford's wall shots. The shot that Buford did of Amanda, I'll show you my version of that. I saw that picture and it knocked my socks off. I had never seen reflections like that, and in black and white. So most of us don't talk about it, Kamonge photographers, but all through the, the 60s, we were surrealists. We didn't talk about it. Photography in black and white is surreal. That's what caught me. Al Fanar <coughs> showed me a series of his photographs. He had been to Japan, married a Japanese woman, comes back, comes back on a boat, and they had these almost Art Deco smokestacks, the round ones and the curves, and these beautiful curves. And he showed it to me in this high key black and white. I said, what is it? I didn't even think it was a photograph. I didn't know what it was. What is it? What's the form? He said, That's, he looked at me, he said, he said, it's a photograph. And then he looked at me and he said, okay, you, you want to get in the group, huh? But they let me in. They, 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 they definitely let me in. They, they were cool. Again, this is part of the events that I do. This is the Afro-American Day Parade. I shoot the Caribbean Day Parade. I used to do this for two reasons. One, after the 60s and 70s, you just couldn't walk around neighborhoods taking pictures of strange people. You just, that was out as a genre, you know, unless you were ready to battle with somebody. I started shooting parades. Another reason why is because of my timing. Parades kept my timing up. If you're a street photographer, the one thing you want to have is time. You want to be able, personally, I don't want, Buford said it, I don't want to take pictures of people <coughs> who are conscious of me taking pictures of them. I want to catch them in their own nature, their own self. You, you remember women, <coughs> as soon as they see the camera, they do something with their hair, check their makeup, do something. That's, the moment I saw is gone. Right, so you want to be stealthy as possible, all right? So for me, the parades really kept my time. You could shoot all you wanted, and you get them, imagine having hundreds of people who want to be photographed. Can you beat that as a photographer? <laughs> this is a Caribbean Day Parade. Now these are events that I've been shooting since the 60s. So nobody will ever see all of my Caribbean Day Parade photographs, all my Afro-American Day photographs. But this is a group that it must have been, God, I've never seen such a large group. There must have been 90 to 120 of people in red. My, the way I did parades was I go out before they started, catch people as they're lining up, getting to their group, socializing, so it's more relaxed, I can ease through the crowds, pick people out, people are standing around. And I must have shot, I shot so many, on, so many photographs on this group, I headed home. <laughs> By the time I got back home, the parade had just started. The one thing you, anybody's ever showed, shot an event like this, the one thing you don't want to do is shoot people walking backwards. Okay? So, but this is one of my favorite out of the, the recent thing I did. I did this in, uh, don't have a date, but in the 90s. It's probably the last time I went. One of the things that happened, when I started going to parades, major parades, Puerto Rican Day, Caribbean, or most, some of the major parades they have in New York, there might have been 40,000 people show up, 30,000 people show up. The Caribbean Day Parade brings a million people out. So with a million people, there's a million and a half cops. So there's no flexibility, there's no movement, you're locked in, they put you somewhere, even if you have a police press pass, you know, 
no, we're not gonna let you, you can't, you gotta go six blocks down that way to cross the street to go to come here. So I've just given up on them. This is my interpretation of Buford's Amanda shot. I never, when I saw windows and glass and reflections, it opened up a whole new world for me. This is a series of photographs called Bebop. Hmm. Right? Bebop represents for me. Some of you know Bebop, when Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, when these guys came on the set, started playing this new music, this different music, that they played the American songbook like you had never heard, you know, that's summertime? I didn't recognize, you know, halfway to the tomb, before, oh yeah, that's summertime, I remember that. What I'm trying to do with this now, again, you can't approach people on the streets anymore. All of what I knew about photography is changing. I'm studying art, I'm teaching. I considered myself an artist. I think I stopped, con I thought photographer was a restraining term for me. So I considered myself an artist. When we started off, when we wanted to learn about composition, could you believe in the 60s there were no, a very few composition photographs, uh, photographic books out? So if you want to learn composition, you had to go to painting books. So I've been studying paintings for 20 some odd years. What I'm trying to do in this is talk about the dynamics of a lens, how it photographs, how it sees things, how many layers. So what I'm doing is taking two dimensional pictures and trying to make them three dimensional visually. Right. So there might be six layers in this photograph. And so it's what's in the glass, it's what's in the window, what the glass is reflecting behind me, what I'm seeing over the top of it. So there's so many layers that you have to try to figure out where's, where's, what's going on. This is a straight photograph. It has nothing been done to it other than sepia tone. I've liked sepia tone for a very long time. This is my second sepia tone portfolio. This is pretty much uh, digital. The uh, Afro-American Parade, I think, started my digital entree. <clears throat> uh, this is the latest work I'm doing. It's called Mysterioso. It's in honor of Thelonious Monk. I'm sure people know. That's why I wore my monk shirt. <laughs> in my teens, I was an odd kid. I have a brother. I didn't know that my brother and I and my mother and father were middle class. I thought I was one of the guys. I kept trying to fit in with one of the guys. I was hanging out with guys who had 13 siblings in the street. And we say, man, that's a lot of brothers. And he said, man, there's two more. They're just waiting to grow into somebody's clothes before they come down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to be one of these guys. We always had suits. We always had, anybody remember Chicago Steelies? Roller skates, they were a brand. Chicago had a, a brand of skates. They were the best skates you could buy. We always had roller skates. We always had stuff, but you know, we keep thinking. I didn't find out that I was, I didn't find out that I wasn't poor than that I was middle class. I didn't find out until I was 30. <laughs> I didn't believe that. I mean, seriously, I'm in the park with this woman. My son's there playing, her son's there playing. And, you know, we're talking about how I grew up. And I said, yeah, I grew up poor. She looked at me and she laughed. I'd never missed a meal. I got my, we used to, my brother and I used to argue with my mother about having chicken every Sunday. I had buddies that, he said, man, my mom had to go out to California to get a job in a plant so we could, she could send money home to feed us. So, I tell you that background story so I don't fit in. The guy said, you need to change your style of dressing. You need to kind of act like us. Now, I worked for a cleaner's called Black and White, believe it or not, on Madison Avenue. And 
the service entrance. I'm going to deliver some garments to somebody. Come out the service entrance. And I see GQ. This is 1957. Anybody old enough to know what GQ looked like in 57? It changed my world. I said, this is the type of clothing that I want. This is the way I want to dress. You got to remember, people in the 50s were wearing, if they were wearing wingtips and wide legs and, you know, the whole two-button suits and, no, I want to tie in, cut, slim, tight. <laughs> so they said, man, you got to stop wearing that shit. Excuse me. You got <laughs> You got to come down to earth. A buddy of mine that I admired, a next door neighbor, gave me a Monk album. He said, go listen to this. At first I said, what? No, this ain't. When the album was finished, you talk about revelations, I understood that I had to be who I was. That was one of the most important epiphanies that I had in my life. Because I was ready to surrender to these guys, and most of them wound up going to jail, most of them wind up dying on overdoses. I might have been one of those. But my epiphany said, no, you gotta be who you were, and Kamoinge came along. So I fit in right there. So that's how I go into Kamoinge. This is, all this is, does anybody recognize what this might be? This is part of what Buford was doing early on. This is a wall that they used to hang posters on. And these are just layers of torn off posters and somebody would go tear them off. Try, you know how you used to try to retrieve them? Some people didn't like them and they would tear them off. So you would have layers of different color posters, different parts and different shapes. I saw a face, I saw a, bird, I saw a person. You might not see it, I do. All right, it's a profile. So all it is, is my seeing, my studying. This is, and this is my favorite wall, too. That I would go by this, this was down on Ninth Avenue, owned by, down by NYU. So the wall went halfway through the block and on the avenue. So I'd just go there and hang out for the day and just stare at the wall. I'd find images. I went home, it was one of my most successful. I'd go home with three or four images sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's my Giacometti. <laughs> I'm sure everybody might know Giacometti was a sculptor that did these very thin, gaunt figures. Now what this is, is a crude patch on a sidewalk. All of this specular stuff, it's what the sidewalk is made out of. I didn't put them there. All I did was intensify the color. These are not photoshopped or anything. And if anybody computer was, this is when I first got my first computer. This is uh, iPhoto 1. <laughs> They've changed iPhoto so much that I can't use it. So this is the end of the series. Once I change iPhoto. <laughs> <laughs> the reason, and again, uh, I come from a black and white school. I'm a black and white photographer. This would not have come about if it hadn't been me going to get a computer. I, I went into digital stuff kicking and screaming. I used to have these long conversations about how I hated computers and the art that was being made with computers was all terrible trash and made up and non-imaginative and all that. All I did was this, these pictures took me five minutes. After I took them, it took me five minutes to do this. I'm not a, I don't have Photoshop. I have a lot of other software and it sits there. I'm still, anybody know that, I'm still using the discontinued version of Aperture. <laughs> yeah, everybody know that one, that's where I'm at. So it is not the technology for me because if the picture doesn't work, throw it away. Go shoot it again. Okay? So, but what it did was that it showed me textures in pavement, in concrete, in surfaces that I didn't know was there. All you had to do was hit a couple of filters. Now, anybody know Photoshop? This is simple. You got about four or five filters you can use. And I played with them, and this is what I got. This is the last, this is part of a new series. This is the most recent photograph I did. 
that I like. <laughs> this is part of a tour bus advertising that show uh, that they did. The exhibition, it's an exhibition of, what was it, I guess it's clay, uh, I don't know what they do, it says it's my body's peeled up, where the skin is peeled off and you can see the nervous system and you can see those. So, and again, I'm rarely out at night, so I was on my way to see a, uh, an exhibition that Adja Collins did. And again, I use really small, inexpensive cameras to do the work that I do. I want to let everybody know this, you know, because to buy a $5,000 camera is absurd as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not working for the New York Times, I'm not, when I was working for newspapers and magazines, I bought the equipment because it paid for itself. Now the equipment doesn't pay for itself, so I can recommend the camera for all you guys that go on vacation, you just want to come back with some decent pictures, buy the simple camera, don't buy anything complicated, mm -hmm. put it on program. I've read articles that even the $5,000 cameras, they're recommending photographers to put it on program because the technology has gotten so good. Okay, so I think that's the last image of mine. Yeah. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both very much. So now that we have a sense of your work, we're going to return in time, beginning with the Black Photographer's Annual to 1973. You better turn around. I'll sure. Better than... I think I think people can hear. Um, so you me. can see the big screen. Yeah. yeah. So I'm in a. One of the things we did, um, the exhibition that's upstairs in the photography gallery, you should go see, is based on this first, um, the first photography's annual first photography annual, and we called Buford. Um, Courtney DeCasey, our archivist, actually figured out that you held copyright at that point and started a conversation about not only doing the exhibition, but digitizing the photographer's annual. And so right now, VMFA has all four volumes of the photographer's annual digitized and online. So it's somewhat inexcusable that I'm going to race through some of these images for the sake of getting you to some jazz music, but I want you to know that you can go online now and see, um, you, can, you can flip through the Black Photographer's Annual on your own time and see a lot of these images. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some of these images quickly and then we can talk. I want to point out that Toni Morrison wrote the foreword for the Black Photographer's Annual, which is worth reading in its own time. Um, but I'm just going to pick um, one quote. She says, it's a true book. It hovers over the matrix of black life, takes accurate aim, and explodes our sensibilities, telling us what we had forgotten we knew, showing us new things about ancient lives and old truths in new phenomena. And this is the list of photographers. I just... I think one of the things that I found so phenomenal, it's, 50, it's 49 photo, uh, 49 photographers and oh, 125 images maybe, around thereabouts. And so this is Sean's image which is in the exhibition and was in the first annual. This is 117th shoot again. This is Buford Smith, Lower East Side. Yes. Yeah, right around the in corner. Fact, uh, I lived on East 11th Street. This, the park was on uh, East uh, 12th Street, it's right around the corner. Again, Buford Smith, same neighborhood? No, this oh. was taken in Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, Fort uh, Bed-Stuy. Hmm. This was the Lower East Side, Brooklyn. I mean, uh, Manhattan. Sean Walker had a portfolio of images in the first volume from Cuba. This is Cuba in 1968. That's, which is a moment in Cuban history. <laughs> oh, yeah. This will come back in a review. We'll see this image again. I just wanted to say that I was in Cuba to do a film. So I became a filmmaker for a period of time. So these were shots that I was able to grab when I wasn't filming. And 
And I'm quickly going to touch on volume two because that had your most extensive portfolio in it. Do you want to? Oh, well, yeah, yes, I, as I mentioned earlier, that one of the uh, perks of being the, uh, the photo editor and also uh, editor with Sean Walker, we chose our own photographs. Uh, Sean Walker didn't pick out mine, or I didn't pick out his on this case. We chose our own photographs. And this was an essay that I had uh, done on Martin, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And I was able to lay it out like I wanted to. I went to publishers and no one liked it. They wanted to say, well, it's not color and blah, 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 to make a long story short. They turned it down. So, so I laid it out myself. I did the uh, whole selection of the photographs. I think it might be about 12 photographs. I'm not sure. This is a very popular photograph. It's been widely published. I guess Black Man Crying or whatever, so. But he, well, could you go back to yeah. that one second? He went, went on the other scene that you don't see in this, but it's on my, my contact sheet and some work prints, is that this was taken on 125th Street and I think Lenox Avenue. And some uh, black guys had gotten a white workman. He was a delivery, a delivery man and they were beating him up. And this guy was saying, you know, please stop. And he was crying and Martin Luther King wouldn't want this. So that's why he was, he was crying. And this was the last photograph in the essay and I call it the, the fire next time. But of course, a lot of publishers, they didn't like that title, but of course it came from James Baldwin. So here we have, you tell us, this is, so this is the first annual a photograph taken by Anthony Barboza, another member of Kamoinge, in his studio as you're putting the annual together. And of course, I shouldn't say of course, but that's me on the left, you probably don't recognize me now. <laughs> <laughs> on the left, and that's my dear friend, uh, Joe Crawford, the, uh, he's deceased now, the publisher of the annual. And on the uh, right there is uh, Ray Francis. He's no longer with us also. Yeah, he's one of the founding members of Kamoinge. Maybe and, you are. And this is at uh, Anthony, Anthony Barboza's studio. On the four top there, that, that's Lou Draper. And the other person, I think, is Vance. Herb Randall. Uh, the, the person is Lou Draper. And uh, the other person, you said that's Herb Randall? It looks like Herb Randall to me, what I could see. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I thought it was what the hairline could be Herb. But I, Herb had no dealings with the, with the photography. And, uh, oh, there you go. I was going to show you. And that's, that's me there with yeah. the glasses and my little hat. Was popular during those days. And we know who this is. That's, oh, I'll let Sean talk about himself. Um, that's after the Italian suits. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have... And that's Lou Draper. But yeah, that's Draper. So he was also one of the picture editors. You had a, a wide... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I chose uh, Lou Draper, Sean Walker, mm -hmm. Ray Francis, and Vance Allen to be on the first selection, selection committee of the annual. And I chose Vance Allen because Vance Allen was an editor at the uh, James Van Der Zee Institute. And Vance Allen's the concept of photography was different from the guys in Kamongi. Vance Allen was more into lines and uh, geometric type photographs. He wasn't into figurative photography. So I felt it was important that we would have somebody who didn't think like us. Mm. And Vance Allen was one of the reasons why I chose him to be on the selection committee. Just and the second contact sheet, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I just, this is a contact sheet that you've shown just of more sessions putting the, putting the annual together. Oh, right. And the uh, second strip to the left, mm -hmm. that's Vernon Grant, who uh, Joe Crawford chose him to be the, uh, the, the designer 
of the uh, annual. And to the right of, of him is uh, Joe Walker, an editor. He was in charge of publicity and the writing of the annual. And he's the one who introduced you to Toni Morrison, is that right? Yes. And that's Joe Crawford to the left, excuse me, and Ver, uh, Vernon Grant in the middle, and uh, Joe Walker to the right. Vernon Grant was the art director for CBS <clears throat> during this time. And that's Joe Crawford. He did not like to be photographed. <laughs> I don't know. He never liked to be photographed. As close as we were, he didn't really want me to photograph him. I said, well, I'm, I know you're 6'2", and I'm 5'8", five, 5'8", five, <laughs> but I'm going to take some pictures. So that was at my loft when I took that picture of Joe. And so let's go back. Joe became the co-founder with you, but you started the idea much earlier. Well, Joe really wasn't a co-founder. Okay. He was a publisher. Okay. Right. Uh, okay, we'll go, we'll go to this. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about how you, you came up with this idea much earlier, and that's this, this, yeah. is, the, this is the initial sketch, right? Right. The uh, genesis of the uh, Photographer's Annual, the Black Photographer's Annual, came out of me being a member of Kamongi. And without me being a member of Kamongi, I seriously doubt that I would have come up with the annual because I was a printer at that time, offset printer. And I, a friend of mine owned a stationery store that had a, a printing machine in the back. And I had printed up a little booklet called Photographic Images. And so I said, well, okay, let me see if I can do a, a book on, the, on Kamongi. And I called the guys together, meet it down my, at my house. I lived on East 11th Street, Sean Walker and the rest of them, they was in there. And I figured out that they would have to contribute, I think it was 10 to $12 each to print this uh, little booklet. And so I made this, this uh, sketch of it. And those are the list of the people who were in, in it. And it fell apart that we never continued, so I put it aside. Maybe about five or six years later, I said, well, you know, we, see, let me try, this, try to do this again. And uh, that's when Jimmy Manis came in. He, Jimmy Manis owned a company called uh, Jammy Productions. It was a loft about the half the size of this auditorium. And he was making uh, silkscreen prints of uh, Black Power posters and, and, and other images. And he also was a filmmaker. And I had a little section off where I had an office where I was working with photography and doing the Black Photographer's Annual, well, thinking about it, rather. So Jimmy would take the posters and sell them to different colleges. And the market for the Black Power posters sort of fell off during the 60s. It's surprising that it did, but it did. So I told Jimmy, I said, well, you know, since the, the posters aren't selling, Maybe I should try doing the Black Photographer's Annual because, you know, Jimmy traveled around and Jimmy knew how to get money. I'm not good with asking people for money. Jimmy was good at that. <laughs> so he said, okay, I'll take the, you know, the strap around and nobody was even paying any attention. One person said, you know, it's a great idea, but you only have about 10 photographers and they're all from New York. You have to get broaden your base with that. Plus you have to come up with the money. So my friend who owned the stationery store, who had the uh, printing machine, I approached him, I told him about, you know, we're trying to get some money, so he said, well, I know somebody who could give you at least $10,000. You and Jimmy come up and meet him, and so we did. And the person will remain, remain nameless now, he eventually died in prison, so that gives you a certain <laughs> background of him. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I, I like the concept, and I'll give you guys $10,000, but you, you're gonna have to make a couple of pornographic movies for me. <laughs> so I said, yeah, you know, Jim and I looked at each other, we said, no, we're interested in the women, but we, we leave that alone. So that died out, so I, we took the annual, put it aside, about maybe, so this was like 69, 70, so Joe Crawford and I, we were very good friends. I met Joe, well, I won't get into how I met him, that's another, I don't know what my time is. But Joe Crawford said, Buford, if I came up with the money, would you do the annual? I said, of course. So I just, eh, yeah, okay. So I gave Joe Crawford a couple of the photographs and the layout that I had done. 
And Joe came back to me in about maybe a month or two months and said, Buford, I got the money. I said, what? He said, yeah, you ready to do the annual? I said, of course. So then uh, we brought in uh, Joe Walker. I didn't know Joe Walker. Joe Crawford was friends with Joe Walker. And Joe Walker worked for the uh, Mohammed Speak, so he knew he had connection with publishers and you know uh, editors and uh, you know black uh, uh, media. So he's the one who got in touch with Toni Morrison, Joe Walker. So when Joe came up with the money, so that's when the ball started rolling and doing the Black Photographers Annual, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then this is a, a photograph of your notes on submission. I thought it was interesting that you you put this out. Well, tell us how you did. How did you get such a wide variety of photographers right. to submit photographs beyond Kamoinge? Uh, beyond Kamoinge, because of, in fact, let me go with this. Back in 1973, we gave each photographer twenty dollars <laughs> for each per photograph, and a lot of uh, photographers today are not getting paid. You just do it for you know get my work published. But back then, we gave photographers twenty dollars each. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I got lost to here for a this second. This is just there. the you put the call out to the oh, different right the call different out. magazines, newspapers. Right, and as I mentioned earlier, that Joe Walker he was an editor of Mohammed Speak, so he had the connection with all the black newspapers. So I wrote up a draft how to get in touch with you know sent it out. So we did that. So that's how we got a, a black photographer. And somebody, someone may think, okay, how did you know they were black? You couldn't tell by the images, of course, but we had a little secret network that how we felt who was black and who wasn't. <laughs> uh, let me one thing. And the image, it wasn't about the, uh, the photographs. Some people say, well, it's the ghetto. Uh, it wasn't even about that. You could submit a, a photograph of a flower or the sun or anything, as long as it was done by a black photographer. And we felt that it was you know, up to our so-called standards or whatever. So it wasn't about what you call black photography, anything like that. It wasn't even about that. And then started getting reviews. So this is the New York Times. In fact, we got fantastic reviews all over the country, Russia, uh, Paris, all over. This is Washington, D.C.? And this was a, a dear friend, Clarissa uh, Wittenborg. She gave us a big play in this, this uh, a newspaper, the Chicago, I can't recall the name, I can't see it. First time we had gotten a spread like that. Mm. And this was the black photographer's uh, portfolio. I had nothing to do with this. This was Joe Crawford's idea. When we had finished, when we had done the fourth annual, we knew that we, we weren't going to the fifth. And Joe said, well, you know what, Buford? I'm gonna do a, a portfolio. This is gonna be we came on with a bang, we're not going out with a whimper. We're gonna do this. I shouldn't say we, but he, well he said we in the sense of the Black Photographer's Annual. But if you notice at the bottom, mm -hmm. it's still a, a Black Photographer's Annual publication, but yeah. the name had been changed to Another View during this time. And it was changed to, for Another View because Joe had received money from the National Endowment for the Arts that's when we got funding. But other than that, Joe came up with the money through friends, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't invest in any money. It was just sweat e equity. So this is Vanderzee, James. This is, uh, I know you may say, oh, that's blurred, it's this. But I, I think this is an important photograph because of the content. You have Mr. James Vanderzee, my dear friend, Joe Crawford, the publisher of the Black Photographers Annual, and Mr. P. H. Pope. So I think it's a very historical photograph and it was worth including. And we met Mr. Pope through uh, Chester Higgins. And so out of that then came exhibitions. So I, I thought it was important to talk a little bit, where we really, I'll, I'll get us to, I know we've got the jazz, uh, jazz, jazz bands waiting for us, but, but out of the annual also was a mission to preserve the legacy of previous black photographers 
including P.H. Polk, who is coming from Tuskegee, Alabama, um, James Vanderzee, as you showed the picture, among others, you talked earlier about Skurlock. So you were also right. then printing here, um, here we go. For this exhibition, you were helping to also print the works of older black photographers right. to preserve Mr. them for exhibitions. Right, Mr. P.H. Polk, he didn't have time to print some of his uh, photographs, and uh, he, I think I, I, I volunteered, oh, yeah, I volunteered that I would print his work. Yeah. But he said, oh, Buford, I only have four by five negatives, and I didn't have a four by five enlarger, so my next door neighbor, Curtis Brown, I asked mm -hmm. him if I could use his enlarger, and he said, sure. So he brought his enlarger over to my loft, which mm -hmm. was uh, two doors down. So I used Curtis Brown's uh, enlarger to print about five or six of Mr. P.H. Polk's photographs. So now we're going to give an image of Kamoenge, just to give the start. So I think Sean should take yeah, the word. Yeah, so we're gonna, we've got to speed through at this point, but this is, like, we'll kind of do a slideshow of Kamoenge over the years. This is uh, done at the first studio museum, which was on Fifth Avenue, between 125th and 126th Street. This is one of the earlier group photographs we did. Uh, don't know who the photographer was, but that was the beginning of Kamoenge. Uh, this is pretty much maybe around late 60s, early 70s. And you can see that it's an eclectic group. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I want to say that pretty much um, most of us, the majority of us, were all living in Harlem. And we're almost living walking distance to each other. So we became a family. We used to call each other homies. We started out with homies, got to be family. Now, we met every Sunday, three hours. Then we go out to eat for another two hours. So girlfriends, wives were totally pissed. <laughs> Totally. Why you got to go sit up with those guys? And they don't know what they're talking about. My, my girlfriend said that these guys don't have an original thought and they're trying to be somebody that they're not. <laughs> now again, Lou Draper comes to New York City with college background, degree. Another brother, Asia Collins, comes with a fine art degree. Roy D. Caraba gets involved. I'm out of high school. I went to high school for photographer because I had a photography because I had a, a uncle who was a photographer. So I'm probably the least technically proficient guy in the group. And they brought me in with open arms. An another one of the members of Come On Gay lived in my block. He said, listen, there's a group of guys getting together. They're going to form a photographic group. So he knew I liked photography, knew it was sort of in my blood because early on I decided I was going to go to the streets. So I gave him all of my equipment. I am this, this passe, I'm going to be a hustler. Fortunately, he came back and rescued me. Or else I'd have been in jail or dead with the rest of the guys I grew up with, that were running with. And that's what I meant by family. They took me in. The first group of photographs I brought to the to, to show. Now, I had an old federal enlarger my uncle gave me. I had a lens with no diaphragm, so I used to have to cut out pieces of paper to make my F-stops. I used to use the family ironing board to put my trays on. I had the enlarger on one of those old metal milk crates. The, the deal was, and I used to wash my prints in the bathtub, the deal with my family was you had to have that stuff out by morning <laughs> so everybody could get to do what they had to get to work and do what they had to do. I brought those to Kamonge and everybody said, man, these are great, blah, 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 blah. Really encouraged me, went out, shot, came back with another set. They said, well, God, we're finally glad you learned something because that first set of photographs were terrible. <laughs> Come on, gay one of getting a gallery. So this is how profound this is. We get a gallery. Yeah, here, let me find uh, it. Lou Draper lives in Langston Hughes' building. So Langston That's Lou was Draper. an influence for us. So we got Roy DiCaraba, Langston Hughes, 
um, Katya Prasant comes to our gallery, right? We had a show with Edward Steichen up at Danbury, Connecticut, up at his hometown, <coughs> right? We had two portfolios in the Museum of Modern Art, right? I mean, so we, we were, for us to have been functioning for 50 years and, and galleries and uh, magazines and institutions said, man, I never heard of you guys. Well, what hole were you living under? Do you understand? This is a photograph done by Roy Dick Robert. We were, again, on 125th Street. There was some kind of a disturbing thing. It was after some kind of a riot they had on 125th Street. Roy said, let me get all you guys together. And it was it called? Um, hatred. Ang hatred in the streets. Hatred in the streets. Roy took the photograph. We all laughed about it. Roy was working with Newsweek at the time. So, and again, Roy, music, and this is mouth, really so what's interesting, and that's another reason why I wore my monk shirt. Music was an integral part of Kamonge, our art, our development. Uh, I looked at a documentary on Mary Lou Williams. If you can find it, PBS produced it, at least they showed it. And Mary Lou Williams was a jazz pianist, but she got really heavily involved with the church. And she, they asked, the church asked her to write a couple of pieces for the church. And she said something very interesting. She said to her, jazz was religious music. And that's what it's been for me all of my life. We played it. We talked about rhythms. We talked about improvisation. So my last two portfolios that you saw is about improvisation. I'm trying to take what you see all the time, and they ain't paid any attention. Mm -hmm. But I'm flipping it and make you, oh, wow, what's that? Well, it's the same thing that you walked and said, I wish somebody would fix that properly. OK, so we all became jazz. And I have to say <coughs> this, too. For all of us, you had to know R&B, because if you wanted to dance and rub up against the girls, you had to know. <laughs> R&B, you know what I mean? That was so, I'm torn between R&B and jazz, but jazz went over. You know, after I got the girls, okay, got you, that's solid, now let's go to the jazz. Okay, fortunately, the, the ladies that I've been with were, liked it, loved it, or tolerated it. Okay, my, I put on, now I don't use records, I use a digital, everybody, you know, I plug in my iPod, and that goes all day. That's my background music. That's the music that makes me think about creativity. This is a camera magazine. This is one of the first major publications that come on Gihad. So this is what I mean. For us to not, for people in the industry not to know about us is racism. Right? The other difference is, too, that each of Kamoenge's members Develop major careers. I have a serious resume. I've been doing this for 50 years. So you get all these guys with these incredible resumes, and put them together, and you say, nobody's heard about you. This is one of the first exhibitions that come on get had. Theme Black at our gallery. We had a gallery in uh, Harlem on 139th Street, which is called Thriver's Row which is a group of brownstones that still exists, and it's one of the most historical places. It was where all the black doctors and lawyers and professional people bought brownstones. And you have to say that uh, you could, at some point in the 70s when drugs hit Harlem, and the old folks, their children didn't want these brownstones, and they were getting out of town, you could buy a five-story brownstone at 15 to 20, 30, 20 or $30,000. Some of them left the furniture in there. Okay, so this is the second woman show, the second show that we had in the gallery. I was at my physical therapist, and he was the building. He's in a brownstone. He said that uh, I might be moving. The owner's selling the building. So one of the customers said, "Well, how much?" He said, "Oh, six million dollars." It's a five-story brownstone, and the two of the patients said, "Oh, that's cheap. You should buy it." <laughs> but you got to understand, you might not be aware, and just hold on that, you might not be aware of it, but in Harlem, you're paying a million dollars a floor for a brownstone floor. 
If you, get a, if you buy a floor and a brownstone, you let the whole floor, you're going to pay almost a million dollars. So when you think about it, a million dollars, six million dollars was cheap. This is another thing, the Inter International Black Photographers. This is another outgrowth of Kamoinge. Me and another Kamoinge member, like the Black Photographers Annual, we said, hey man, we need to honor some of our senior photographers. Let's put something together to do that. So we decided to do a dinner and a dance. Uh, Van der Zee, Polk, Gordon Parks, uh, um, Minetta Sleet, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Minetta Sleet. Minetta Sleet is one of the most important, undiscovered, unknown black photographers. He worked for, what was it, Ebony? Ebony. Worked for Ebony, and the contract that he had, that Ebony owns every single one of his photographs. His negatives. So, uh, but he was honored. So we did these, we did three of these dinners. The last one, we had 1,500 people show up. It was, like I said, a dinner for those people who could pay a little bit more money and wanted to rub shoulders with the artists. Then we had an open call for uh, photographers. Mm -hmm. This is Roy and his wife, Sherry, and the opera singer. I don't know, somebody out there knows who she is. <laughs> Pardon me? Anybody know? Uh, Jesse Norman. Jesse Norman. Norman, okay. I was really disturbed that Jesse did not want me to take a picture. How do you come to an opening? <laughs> You know, you come to the open, and that's what the hand thing is about. And I really, you know, I really wanted to say something, and I wanted to go into my ghetto kind of thing on her. I really did. You know, and I understand the privacy and all of that, but when you're at an opening, then you say to Roy, listen, uh, you know, I'll see you, or we'll do have dinner after the open, something, but you don't come in a public place. Oh, photographers, there's every, half of the people in there are photographers. <laughs> All right. This was, uh, this was the, I think, the last one we gave. And in the photograph, this Chuck Stewart, who just passed, Roy DiCarava, Manetta Sleep, Bird Andrews, and I don't know if anybody heard of Bird Andrews. Bird Andrews shot black theater for years. Studio caught fire, burned up most of his negatives, but somehow or another, the Smithsonian had, was wise enough to buy some of his work early on, so he was able to retrieve it and get a book out. So he's another photographer that you should go, but Bert Andrews is important. There's uh, Buford Smith. There's another magazine called 810. Now, this is interesting. Here's a woman comes from England that knows about us, but New Yorkers don't know anything about us. Right, she did, an she did an interview with Buford, she did an interview with me, I think Tony, and then some other uh, members of Kamange Workshop. Roy. And Roy. So now we're starting to move forward in time to show. Excuse me, one thing we should mention that when we talk about Roy, we haven't mentioned that he was the first black photographer to receive a Guggenheim yeah, in 1955. Uh, yeah. 55. And he didn't found the group. And after as that, sometimes gets stated, Kamoinge, yes, but he was no. your, you asked him to be your first president, I believe. Uh, yes. Well, Sean would take care of that because I came in two years later. Yeah. But uh, Roy didn't, well, okay, I'll let Sean. Let me just say that. something, too, that was important about the Black Photographers Annual and ICP and most of the events that we did. You got to remember, this was before computers, this was word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You would call a photographer, say you call 10 people. And each person we call, we ask them to call 10 people. And that's how this Black Photographer's Annual, that's how the ICP, um, IBP, and these things really got off the ground by word of mouth. So just always keep understanding that before computers, the word still got out. This is one of the, the, the last group shots we had until Tony showed, sent you that one? Or, no, you, no, there's you, another you one You sent me here. this one. This okay. is from you, yeah. This was taken at Herb Robertson studio. And this is the scholarship that's been formed? Yeah, this is at uh, Columbia uh, College in, uh, in Chicago. We did a major uh, exhibition and fundraiser for them. Now. Kamon gave, other than the short period of the gallery we had, we met in other people's studios. This is done in my home. Over the years, a, a majority of the meetings were done in my place. We were done in Tony's studio, we were done in Herb's studio. And one thing I have to mention, really quickly, once we all pretty much left Harlem, 
we wound up, Buford bought Roy's loft. Another photographer moved next door to him. I got his place. Herb Robinson, Lou Draper, Herb, um, 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 who else? Ray Danny Francis, Dawson. Danny Dawson. So now we create a community on 38th Street and 6th Avenue. <coughs> so there are like six Kamonga members on 38th Street and 6th Avenue. Most people don't know about that, and I think it's important because we were the early of the loft dwellers. Right, and so again, that's why we became family. Buford babysitted me. I was a single father. Ba Buford babysitted for me. Ray Francis babysitted for me. You used to see me with portfolio in one hand and my son in the other hand trying to go get work. Okay, so that's Kamoinge. That's the last shot. Yeah, we're having a little, there we go. Oh, oh that's a lot. Yeah, good. We're, we're good, we can. 